The Christian heritage in antiquity is a great pluralism of religious ideas. Orthodoxy had not yet arrived at a dominant position. At that point, orthodoxy was just one of the many trends on the religious scene. It would be good to remind ourselves of the contact of this heritage with the Arabs. Usually the first visual impression a modern Westerner receives when thinking about the ancient Arabs is the people group that travels on camel, but they are restricted uh, to the Arabian Peninsula. And um, unfortunately, there is a common misconception to think just like that. To think about the Arabic history as a beginning with the Prophet Muhammad, whilst the pre-Islamic past, the previous history, being relegated to the so-called Jahiliya, the days of the ignorance, of the dark barbarity and anarchy. This is far from being truth. Before the whole Arab expansion, Arabs weren't confined to the peninsula only. They were scattered all across the Middle East. Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia, even parts of the western Persia, as well as Anatolia. A mixed bunch of people, from farmers and town folks, religious and philosophical leaders, to full-on nomads, Scanites, so-called. Oddly enough, there wasn't any term or formal title for the folks in the Arabian Peninsula itself. The term Arab first appears in Assyrian inscriptions pointing to those nomads to the west of the river Euphrates, just to demarcate between the nomadic brethren and the sedentary settled one. Arabs weren't seen as a distinct group for a while. It took a long time for the Arab identity to take a shape. So when somebody talks about pre-Islamic Arabic era, remember it's not just about nomads wandering somewhere in the deserts. It's a complex tale of a diverse and dynamic landscape of multiple communities. For many Christians living in the West, the idea of Jesus coming into contact with the Arabs during his earthly ministry is mostly unheard of. However, the Gospel accounts, specifically the book of Mark, tell us the different story. Gospel accounts highlight diverse crowds, including people from the Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, and Transjordan. The last two lands were most certainly populated by the Arabic tribes. And that is noteworthy, because it shows that already in early ministry of Jesus, Arabs were attracted to his message and wanted to be his followers. It appears that Jesus had strong ties with the Arab communities during his time in the Galilee, meeting them on a daily basis and concentrating his ministry primarily among the pagan population. Despite the post-death visitations in Galilee, Jesus' message had limited impact on its mixed population, deeply devoted to the local pagan cults. Galilee's population was diverse but still largely pagan, initially under Iturian control and conquered by the Hasmonean dynasty. The Greek historian Strabo didn't see it as a purely Jewish, despite the presence of the Jewish settlements. This is supported by the archaeological evidence since the synagogues in the Galilee unearthed by the modern archaeologists post human images and, yes, even pagan deities like the most popular one in the Roman religion, Sol Invictus, unconquered son. Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, as it stated in the Bible, yet ancient craftsmen working in the biblical land were apparently undeterred by the divine injunction given at the Mount Sinai. If Judaism was present in the Galilee, it was a highly Hellenized form of Judaism. Speaking about the Hellenized Judaism, Apostle Paul, as for him, there is a one passage from the Bible that clearly speaks about the Paul's involvement in Arabia and with its people. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul recounts God's grace, revealing the Jesus and proclaiming him among the Gentiles. Without consulting human beings or going to the Jerusalem, Paul went straight away to Arabia, emphasizing the universality of his mission. The early presence of Jesus' followers in Arabia just a few years after his death is a key factor in explaining Paul's stay there 
and the rapid spread of the gospel after the Romans took control over the Nabataean state. This contrasts with the slower spread of a gospel adherence in the Antioch, where the followers initially labeled as the Christians grappled with a new god that transcends ethnic boundaries. Hellenistic Christianity was extremely influential during the first centuries in the Syro-Arabia region. A big player in the Paulinism was Marcionism. Marcion shook things up by saying that the Old Testament God was a totally different from the New Testament one. He saw that the Old Testament God was a bit of a tyrant, who is no different from the Gentile gods, the spirits of the world, stahia to cosmo, as Apostle Paul put it, whilst the New Testament God was all about love, kindness, and mercy. On top of that, Marcion thought Paul was the only true disciple of the Jesus Christ. Marcion also was the first person to put the oral Christian traditions into the one singular narrative. Hence, in modern biblical scholarship there is a big discussion regarding the Marcion canon. He himself was from the Sinope in Pontus, where his dad was a local pastor. Not much, unfortunately, is known about his early spiritual journey in the eastern Mediterranean. But things got heated up when he traveled to the Rome around the age of 50, where he was being branded pejoratively Gnostic. Despite of that, Marcion wasn't explicitly labeled as such by his contemporaries. It was the idea brought up by the Tertullian, who claimed that Marcion derived his teachings from the Gnostic teacher Curdo. This assertion is disputed by the modern scholarship. Marcion dualism differed from the Curtis stark opposition of good and evil. And the whole soteriology of Marcionism seems to be related to the faith rather than to the knowledge. Marcionism gained traction among the upper classes in the Hellenistic cities of Syria and Arabia at some point. However, the practical implications of Marcionism expressed through the rigid asceticism and the promotion of virginity posed significant challenges. The insistence on the baptized individuals renouncing marriage dampened enthusiasm among the Hellenized population. Nevertheless, the Arameans were more accepting, content to be part of the majority classified as the hearers in a community that had an elite class of the baptized or initiated. The grading of Christian, a prominent feature of the Syro-Mesopotamian Christianity, persisted. Marcionism accommodated both heroes of the faith in the past and the average person, while the martyrs in Marcionite communities were likely baptized individuals, the religion gradually waned in the western Syria due to its practical peculiarities, losing the appeal among the elites. Antiochian Christianity, backed by the secular power, persecuted dissidents. Despite churches being constructed for the Marcionites in the 3rd century, the earliest dated Christian inscription found in the province of Arabia, found at Deir Ali village southeast of the Damascus, belonged to a Marcionite community and built in the year 318. While it was declined in the Hellenistic circles in Syria, it nevertheless flourished in Mesopotamia. Theodoret, an Antiochian theologian, mentioned Marcionite communities numbering in thousands in the middle of the 5th century, although the details of its appeal and propaganda remain largely unknown. One of the most prolific students of Marcion was Station. Born around the second half of the second century and best known for his major work, Diatessaron, a gospel harmony that sought to combine the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into the one single cohesive narrative. Station likely composed this work for the purpose of spreading the gospel across the Mesopotamian world. Whilst the Diatessaron played a crucial role in the early Christian literature and the liturgy, especially among the Aramaic-speaking communities, Tatian's legacy is not without the controversies. He himself was associated with the Ancratites, a Christian ascetic group that advocated for a strict self-discipline, 
including the abstinence from the marriage and the certain types of the food. This ascetic stance, coupled with the Tatian's rejection of the various aspects of the Greek or Roman culture, led to the tensions and the criticism from the European Christian communities. Tatian's disciple, an Arab Gnostic named Monoimus, likely just a simple Greek rendition of the Arabic name Munaim, is a quite fascinating figure according to the accounts of Hippolytus. Monoimus put forward a two principal theory of the all the man, the higher God, who is both unborn and immortal, and the son of man, born independently of time and divine will. These principles were seen as inseparable. Monoimus used the parable of the fire and the light emitting from the fire to prove this point. This understanding is particularly intriguing since the fire and light in Arabic share the same linguistic root. In the myth, the man is depicted as invisible and unknown, whilst the son of man is to the some extent knowable through his manifestations. Manoimus assigned a significant role to the son of man in maintaining the creation, who was like a demiurge figure. His portrait is generated by the Anthropos, by the man outside of the time, but still he is a subject of passion. The entire cosmos is believed to originate from a part of the Son of Man, finding unity in him, yet none of the elements of the universe fully reveals the Son of the Man. Hippolytus notes an interesting detail. Monoimus used the ideas of being and becoming, nikai eheneto, a wording that echoes the Johannite prologue and the Quranic concept of the generation of Adam and Jesus with a Kun Fayyakun, be and he became. The Arabic verb kawan aligns with the Greek ginomai, to become, to generate. The idea of the Son of Man as a heavenly figure was not unique to Monoimus. It resonated in various Gnostic traditions, likely tracing back to the Enochian literature, where it denotes a celestial messianic figure. This concept also surfaces in the Nascene fragment. Interestingly, Hippolytus' refutation, likely originated from the same source, takes a jab at the mysterious serpent-worshipping Ophites. The theological structure mirrors Monoimus, with a higher transcendent man, Anthropos, and the demiurge son of the man. Due to this theological parallel, some scholars have even suggested that Monoimus himself might have had Nascene affiliations. Beyond the controversies of the such diverse ascetic movements, the early church figure Origen found himself mingling with the Arab Christian tribes in the Syro Arabia region too. Origen likely first encountered the Arabs during his early visits to the North Arabia. His influence among the bishops of Arabia shines through the writings of the Jerome, a prominent church writer of the middle of the 4th century. According to the Jerome's writings, Origen faced condemnation at the Council of Alexandria, with almost all European churches, including that of Rome, backing this decision. This was because Origen believed in the pre-existence of soul, as well as the temporality of the hellfire. However, the Jerome's records reveal a different side, indicating that the bishops of Palestine, Arabia, and Phoenicia supported the Origen, during his visits to Arabia, Origen engaged in discussion with a Berilus, the Nabataean Arab bishop of Bosra, who held unconventional beliefs. Remarkably, Origen persuaded the Berilus to adopt his own theological stance. Throughout the multiple visits, he dialogued with the local bishops and clergy, clarifying and defending his own faith. He also wrote letters to the regional bishops offering theological guidance as well as the support. These visits and correspondences played a vital role in establishing and maintaining the Christian faith in the Arabian region, contributing significantly to the overall growth and development of the Christianity. But it doesn't stop even there. Origen corresponded with the Marcus Julius Philippus, a Roman emperor with the Arab roots, during his third trip to the Arabia. That shows how much people respected the origin as a Christian leader, 
Eusebius, another church historian, backs up the Origen third visit and credits the Philip the Arab as the first Christian emperor. Yeah, you heard it right. An Arab, not a Roman, a first Christian emperor. Quite remarkable. In the 3rd centuries in Syria and Mesopotamia, Catholic Christianity faced another formidable rival in the form of Manichaeism. Manichaeism in particular emerged as a strong contender, spreading rapidly and widely and posing a significant challenge. Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, hailed from a Persian ancestry, but is better to be described as a Syriac-speaking Babylonian. Mani's influence grew to the point where the Shapur I, the Persian ruler, granted him complete freedom to propagate his religious ideas. Shapur even at some point considered recognizing Manichaeism as a potential national religion of Persia, viewing it as a more appealing than the various forms of Zoroastrianism, which Mani radically opposed. However, after the Shapur's death, his successor, Narsi, had to consider the backlash from the Mazdian priesthood, leading to the persecution of Manichaeans. Mani met a grim fate. According to the Arab accounts, he was flayed alive. Despite the persecution, Mani's teaching persisted, especially among the Arabs in the region of Hira, the capital of the Lahmid kingdom. The Persians, seeking Arab support against the Roman rivals, did not interfere with the religious polity of the Arabs of Babylonia, allowing Manichaeism to spread even further. The Lahmid Arab king Amru ibn Adi reportedly intervened with the Narsi on behalf of the Manichaeans. This would play a significant role later on in the future, when an offshoot of Manichaeism, Mazdakism will spark the revolution in Iranian land, with some Arabic tribes like Inda and Kinana, adopting new religious formula. I have a separate videos on these two religious traditions and their relationship with the Arabs. Check them out if you are interested. Manichaeism itself emerged from the another group, Elkazites, a Jewish Christian movement led by a prophet Elkazai. This group gained attention during the time of the Emperor Elgabalus. The story goes that the guy named Alcibiades from Syria showed up in Rome claiming that he has a book from a Parthia given to the Elkazai by an angel. According to the Alcibiades, this angel was a colossal figure almost a hundred miles high and the sixteen miles wide. This giant celestial being was considered the son of God, accompanied by his own sister, the Holy Spirit, of the same massive size. The notion of the big angels was a thing in a certain Jewish mystical literature. Alcibiades announced the fresh forgiveness of sins and described a baptism that could even absolve the worst sinners. Those following this tradition, much like today's Mandaeans, dressed in white and conducted water baptisms. Alkazites, among other Jewish Christian groups, were located in Arabia, living in places like Etoria, Perea, Moab, and Transjordan, alongside groups like the Ebionites. Epiphanius also talks about the Valesians, a group led by an Arab named Valens, based in Bakatha, near the city of Philadelphia, in the modern-day Jordan. Rumors circulated that they practiced self-castration. Followers weren't allowed to eat meat until they went through the castration ritual, as it was believed that eating certain foods will tempt to the lost. The belief seemed aligned with the Manichaeans, embracing an anti-natalistic stance, the idea that reproduction itself is inherently evil, perpetuating the suffering in the world. Castration may sound bizarre for today's time, but the practice was quite popular among the early Christians. So, for example, the Origen, I've already mentioned, secretly castrated himself which drew malicious mockery later on by the Christian authors. Origen would be declared as the heretic, despite being the most influential church father for his contemporaries. Another noteworthy group mentioned by Epiphanius, and most likely also mentioned as an unnamed opponent in the Quran, 
is the Antidecomarianites. They deviated from the mainstream beliefs by claiming that the Virgin Mary had children beyond the Jesus. However, their major departure was on adoring Mary as the goddess. They adopted a custom from the Scythia, offering ritually sanctified cakes called Caliris to Mary and consuming them, earning the name after the cakes, Caliridians. These practices appear to be an effort to incorporate the pagan rituals into the Christianity, considering that the worship of the goddess Allah was a popular in the places where this tradition took hold, both before and during the rise of Christianity, it is very plausible that the veneration of female deity was transposed to the Mary as the central figure in the Christianity. Also not to be forgotten is the frequent association of Mary with the Holy Spirit, or sometimes even identification of both, which was a characteristic feature of some Syriac traditions. For example, as in the Odes of the Solomon, Regarding the Syriac tradition, Epiphanius also mentioned the Odius, a Syrian deacon from Mesopotamia. Odius spoke out against the corruption infiltrating the church, particularly condemning the luxurious lifestyles and the greed of many bishops and clergy. This outspokenness drew the ire of the ecclesiastical establishment of the church. The group that followed the anti-clerical inspirational leader was called after his name, the Audience. Around the time of the well-known Council of Nicaea, Audius started a group that focused on the living simply and rejected the church hierarchy. His movement caught on in Mesopotamia, Arabia and the Palestine. Notably, he embraced anthropomorphic beliefs, interpreting the biblical passage, let us make man in our image, quite literally. The god was humanoid according to him idea which was popular in syro mesopotamian world and could be found among other religious traditions like the Mazdaism, Babylonian Judaism and Mandaism. Even some ascetic movements in Egypt with roots in Syria and Mesopotamia believed in this notion. The audience reportedly used the textual tradition that bears a striking resemblance to those later discovered in the Nag Hammadi library by the modern scholars. According to the Theodore Bar Kanai, an 8th century Nestorian bishop, the audience not only relied on the Bible, but also incorporated certain pseudoepigraphic apocalypses into their own teachings. The audience theology attributed the creation of the world and the human body to the various divine powers. Theodore's quoted text suggests a complex cosmology involving the multiple creators and their roles in forming the both soul and the physical body. It even delves into interpersonal relationship between these divine beings, particularly concerning the creation of the human life. The formulation and terminology of this text strikingly resemble perhaps one of the most famous texts found in the Nag Hammadi. The Apocryphon of John. Odious activities in Arabia caught the eye of the church authorities, leading them to convince Emperor Constantine to exile him to the Scythia. In Scythia, Odious took up missionary work among the pagan Goths. His successor, however, faced expulsion by the Gothic king. By the time Epiphanius wrote, he observed that the Odiani movement was on steep decline. Convents in Arabia and Palestine had been abandoned, leaving only two surviving centers, one at the Kalhis in Georgia and the other in Mesopotamia. Another important Syriac-speaking Christian tradition was Julianism. It was named after the Julian of Halicarnassus, a bishop who was excommunicated for his unorthodox use on the nature of the Christ. Julianism rejected the traditional Christological doctrine of the Council of Halcedon, which affirmed that Christ had two distinct natures. Despite the clear difference from this Halcedonian theological stance, Julian's main opponent at the time was another monophysite theologian, Severus of Antioch. The main difference between Severus and Julian's views was the interpretation of how exactly the Adam's body changed after the fall. For the Severus, 
Adam didn't literally lose his original incorruptible nature. Adam was only given the promise of the grace of incorruption by the communion with God. Adam's disobedience with God removed this promise which led him to experience through the knowledge given after the eating from the forbidden tree what naturally belongs to his body, which is death, illness, and corruption. For Julian, this position was completely unacceptable. He believed that after the fall, there was a physical transformation, not just a mere insight gained from the tree of knowledge. This particular discussion was intimately connected to the nature of Christ himself, which was absolutely normal for the Christian tradition of that time. Christ represented a new man who came to replace the old man, Adam, a view derived from the Pauline epistles. Julian disagrees with this position where Christ was identical with Adam after the fall in his nature. What then the Christ victory over death if he is no different from mere mortals? No, Christ took on Adam's nature before the fall in order to save us, fallen people who have incomplete corruptible bodies. The major proof of this is Christ being born of a virgin without a man. The purity of birth proves the purity of Christ's humanity as incorruptible and immortal. Christ did die and suffer, but these experiences were voluntary, in the sense that he allowed his immortal and incorruptible humanity to experience them, but in a different way than other humans experience them, which are by necessity of their nature. Christ's death as per this perspective wasn't regular human departure. It was more like an elaborate theatrical performance. His divine nature prevented a genuine death. Instead, his demise was a staged act, a grand example played out voluntarily. In this narrative, everything about Jesus' human experiences, eating, sleeping, drinking, was considered a part of this divine play. Byzantine Emperor Justinian I, despite often misrepresentation of him as a defender of Chalcedonian orthodoxy, fully embraced the tenets of Julianism. He went all in attempting to elevate the Julianism to the status of the orthodox dogma. Some historians say that Justinius' interest in the Julianism stemmed from his desire to reconcile with the different monophysite groups, considering the Julian as the opponent of the Severus, a figure widely seen as the foe of the orthodoxy. Justinian pragmatically chose Julian over the Severus because simply the former was willing to make concession to the Byzantium. Justinian even prepared an edict to spread Julianist beliefs throughout the empire. However, he passed away during the 39th year of his reign before he could make it happen. Talk about the timing. Within a decade of the Julian's death, his followers spread throughout the Syriac-speaking Near East, later finding refuge in the South Arabia during the persecutions. Some Julianists fled to the Najran after being expelled from the Constantinople. Although not the majority, Julianists managed to survive in the Miaphysite milieu. The Julianist bishop sent to the Himyar successfully appointed a successor, and the community was robust enough to send missionaries to Aludia, which in the present-day Sudan. Sometimes called the Najranites, Julianists were even speculated by scholars to be linked to the famous martyrs of the Najran, which by some Muslim scholars were linked to the Ashab al in the Quran. I recently have read an article, I will not name the author and the title for the sake of being respectful, but in this article, the author tries in every way possible to deny the need of the non-Orthodox movements within Christianity to explain the phenomenon of the early Islam. I personally categorically disagree with this position, and I believe that it is precisely in non-Orthodox forms of Christianity that we can find the clues to how Islam emerged as a separate religious tradition. We know, for example, that the Manichaeans, Marcionites and Audians, as well as many 
Jewish Christian sects existed after the advent of Islam. There is no doubt that these movements were within the reach of the early Muslim community, and investigation into the heterodox Christian literature, including written in Syriac, Coptic, and of course Ethiopic, uh, the language of many pseudepigraphical writings, not only of the New but also the Old Testament, deserves a further attention. As for now, as always, with you was the host of the Gnostic Quran channel. If you wish to support the channel, links are in the description box below. Thank you, and I will see you next time.